So hi everyone, this is Praveen Poddar and I am working as a specialist BD for analytics in AWS. Today I am going to discuss a bit about modern data strategy and how AWS can uh, help you in achieving this uh, modern data strategy using AWS services. So let's start. So as I said, we are going to discuss a bit about modern data strategy. We are going to see how you can build a data architecture using AWS services and then at the end, we are going to show you how to create a architecture using AWS services. So the one reference architecture, I'm going to show it in my presentation today. So let's start. So now we are going to discuss a bit about modern data strategy. When we speak about modern data strategy in AWS, we generally say that it is based on three pillars, modernize, unify, and innovate. Now we'll go to these uh, pillars one by one. Let's start with modernize. So when we say modernize, what happens that uh, your data, when you are storing it or when you are creating a data platform, okay, most of the time we think more about infrastructure. Like suddenly a business problem come that you want to analyze. Let's take an example, okay. Let's say you want to see that what kind of traffic is coming in your platform or in, or, or in your website or what exactly people are searching in your website, okay? There are a lot of e-commerce website available which generally, you know, checks like, okay, if certain person is buying an iPhone or any other phone, he might, you know, uh, buy the phone case as well. So they are trying to improve their sales based on, uh, based on, you know, uh, the behavior of uh, buying pattern of a user, okay? So what happens that to analyze this thing, Generally, what these company do, like, you know, they check, like, you know, how much, what exactly you are clicking on their website, okay? They gather those data and do perform some kind of analytics on top of that. And then based on that, they decide, okay, I can show it, like, you know, if some person is buying a mobile phone, that means later on he can buy a mobile phone case as well, right? So the thing is now to have this kind of data, now just imagine, like, you know, you have billion of users, billions of users, or at a worst case, just assume that you have millions of users, okay? And every second you are capturing those, you know, click stream data. So how big it can be, right? Now, what happens in a normal case is that, you know, generally you think, okay, how I'm going to store this kind of data? Whether my infrastructure can scale it or not? What kind of licenses I need to buy? Whether my traditional relational database it can store this kind of data or not, whether I can analyze, you know, whether I can analyze this data faster or not. Now, the thing is like, you know, instead of concentrating on uh, on this kind of business problem, generally people concentrate more on current infrastructure. So when you are building a modern, uh, modern data strategy or you want to build a modern data platform, you have to, instead of thinking, you know, about your existing infrastructure, you have to think more about your business problem. And in order to do that, what you need to do is like, you have to choose that data platform which can be easily scalable, okay? Which can be trusted, which can be secure, okay? So ra rather than focusing on infrastructure, focus on business problem. Then second thing is unify. So in an enterprise or, or you know, in an, any agency, okay? You have multiple application. It can be an ERP, it can be a CRM, it can be, you know, normal, you know, uh, if, if you talk about ad tech industry, okay, it can be an LMS. If you go to retail, there can be different, you know, different kind of applications are there in an enterprise. Now, if you want to see the combined report, okay, then you have to unify all this data. And the problem with unify is like, you know, data can reside anywhere and in any format. So some data can be residing on cloud, some data can be residing on premise, some data can be residing on different, you know, private cloud as well. Now, and some data can be on a relational data, some data can be a non-relational data, some data can be coming as batch data, some data can be a real-time data. How you are going to unify this data? There can be different type of data, there can be different place of data. And in order to unify, uh, you know, this data, you need those services which can easily take data in any format and from anywhere and push it to a data lake or a data warehouse. And lastly, which is innovate. So when we say innovate, means once you have data, what you want to do with that data? 
you might want to create some kind of uh, a very good dashboard with that you want might want to expose an api uh, for that data so that you know other department or you know you you might want to sell that data as well okay or it is possible that you might want to do some kind of ai ml uh, you know model uh, with that data so it all depends upon your requirement what how exactly you want to consume that data so these three pillar first is like don't think about the infrastructure much okay choose that that uh, that platform which can be easily scalable and trusted then you have to choose a data platform where you can easily unify all your data in one place at one place and then you need to choose that platform where you can easily consume your data be it as a dashboard be it as an api be it ai model or predictive model it's up to you or up to your business requirement now we'll discuss a bit about data architecture how you can build the data architecture and today i'm going to discuss like how aws can help you achieving this modern data architecture so when we say about a modern data architecture so typically uh, at a very high level we can say that generally in a modern data architecture you can have different type of data sources it can be streaming data source it can be a batch data source data can be structured data can be unstructured and you need some service by which you can ingest it and once you are ingesting the data then you have to clean that data so that means you have to store it in a landing zone then you will be doing some kind of processing on top of that and then that curated data will be there by which once your curated data will be there you need to do some kind of cataloging and of course you can be consume that data using some kind of consumption service and last not the least is how to secure and govern this data so generally if we see uh, the previous architecture okay so this modern data structure had generally six stage or we can say six layers data ingestion layer data storage layer data cataloging layer data processing layer data consumption layer and security and governance layer i will go uh, to these layer one by one we'll start with data ingestion how you can ingest your data into your data platform now when we are talking about this data ingestion layer there can be different type of data sources your data source can be a relational database or can be a non relational database your data source can be a file it can be a plain csv file or an excel file as well or even sometime you know edi files or it can be uh, a different different type of file it can be an xml file also then there can be some data which you can be getting from some third party data products like you know sap can provide you some data uh, salesforce can provide you some data so there can be different third party data products which can be providing you some data and then custom data sources are also there so you have some custom application by which you want to get some data and then these day we all have, we all knew like there are some iot applications like in manufacturing it's quite relevant in retail it's quite relevant so there are multiple places multiple places you can see like you know iot applications are there and those data can be streaming so click stream can be a very good example for this like you know those click stream is streaming to your data platform quite regularly how you are going to ingest all this data so data for Surface or data into one platform. We'll start with the database data sources. I have presented two particular services uh, here uh, by which you can move the data into the data platform. Now, please note that the destination I have mentioned it as S3 and Redshift. Now, we'll discuss a bit about Redshift later on. Uh, so, Redshift is our data warehouse. And when I'm talking about this F3, please think that I'm talking about a data lake. Okay, so F3 is a storage for, uh, uh, for our data lake. So just think that I'm talking more about here data lake and data warehouse. Okay, so let's say you have a relational database. Okay, and you want to move that data into a data platform. And when we say data platform, so that means we, we are saying that we have to either move it to a data lake or to a data warehouse. 
how we are going to move it. So the first service which is available with AWS is AWS Data Migration Service, which we call it as AWS DMS. Now what it do like, you know, whether your database is residing on, uh, uh, on premise or whether it is residing uh, uh, in any cloud, this AWS DMS can read the data and move the data to S3 and Redshift. Even this service can be used uh, for you know replicating your data. For example, if let's say you have a SQL server here on the source side, okay, DMS can also move this data to a SQL server instance in uh, AWS side, okay. But this session we are talking more about you know building a data platform or building an analytical platform here. So I will be concentrating more on moving the data to a data lake or to a data warehouse. So this DMS can help you do, do that. It's a true CDC kind of service. So that means first time it will be full load and later on you can have like, you know, uh, uh, delta load you can do uh, with, the, with this particular service. And it will be a real time service. So that means anytime this change will happen in your database immediately. When I say immediately, the gap will be there. Some, you know, uh, two, three second or five second gap will be there, but uh, you can move it to uh, to 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 your destination. Now, if let's say you don't have requirement of moving the data from uh, from your database to your data lake or data warehouse immediately, or if you want to do some kind of you know a batch transformation or batch you know batch movement of data, so then there are different services available. I will be talking a little bit about AWS Lake Formation Blueprint. Okay. So another service is AWS Lake Formation Blueprint. I'm going to speak about lake formation later on in uh, my presentation. But there is a feature in lake formation service which we call as uh, AWS Lake Formation Blueprint. Now what this service do, it can read the data. If your database is MySQL or Postgres, it can read the data and move it to the a data lake. It cannot move it to uh, to a data warehouse, but of course, a data lake. If you want to uh, create, then lake formation can help you there. The good thing is, like, it will be a batch service kind of thing. So that means, let's say you have hundred tables in a database. Behind the scene, it will create hundred jobs, and all the data at certain uh, you know configured uh, interval, it will move the data into the S3. Of course, in S3, in data lake, you can decide which format, in, in, in which format you want to store the data, be it a parquet format, be it a ORC format, or you want to store it in a hoodie catalog or anything. Okay, you can decide it here, but this lake formation can help you in this. Now, so, so one service was helping you in real-time migration, another service was helping you in uh, batch migration, but please understand that both these services, you can move the entire database. But, what if I say that you don't want to move the complete database rather than you want to move certain table, okay? So we have a service called Glue. What this Glue is doing here is that it's a serverless service. Behind the scene, uh, Spark cluster is running, okay? It can help you in ETL things. So there is a visualization layer on top of that Spark, which is built by AWS which is kind of low code you can say, okay, where you can drag and drop the thing and you can do your ETL very easily. Then if let's say you are a business analyst, you don't want to do any code, so we have another uh, feature or another service in Glue, which we call it as a Glue Data Brew, by which you can prepare your data. You can do those basic uh, and some advanced level uh, ETL as well using Glue Data Brew. Okay, and of course, with Glue, you can also do the data replication because it's behind the scene, it's a Spark cluster. And with by using that Glue uh, visualization tool, what will happen that ultimately you are dragging and dropping those, you know, ETL things. Behind the scene, it will generate a PySpark code for you. Okay, so of course, if Spark, you can do, using Spark, you can of course do the data replication or do your ETL processing as well. Okay, so here in Glue also, you can do the same. In fact, uh, with that lake formation blueprint, which I just talked about, behind the scene, actually creating the Glue jobs only. Okay, so here you can do that data replication using Glue. And of course, either if, if your destination can be, your destination can be a data lake, your destination can be a data warehouse, even your destination can be a, data, uh, a normal database as well. So Glue can help you in achieving all these things. Okay, so 
in this presentation you are going to hear this glue word multiple time because glue for us is not just a ETL tool there are other features also available in this glue which I am going to talk later in this particular presentation. So moving forward to another data source which can be a file your file can be refining at your own premise let's assume that there are some file which is available in your data center and you want to move it to the cloud how you can move it so we have our data sync service in which we generally install a data sync agent uh, on your premise and then this data sync agent can copy your data and move it to the f3 now there are snow devices uh, available as well if let's say you have large chunk of data and you have some bandwidth issue and you want to immediately not immediately I, I i would rather say you know you want to move it to the aws cloud faster of course it can range up to 10 to 15 days okay where we generally ship a snow device to you you can copy your data and then once we will receive that snow device we can copy into uh, to to s3 or eff or anywhere okay please note that uh, if you have huge chunk of data which will take months or you know a uh, lot of months or couple of months of time you know then only the snow can device generally is used now moving into the SaaS application data so we know like uh, in an enterprise generally we have we know like there can be a different erp system right it can be sap it can be dynamics it can be oracle it can be anything okay and if let's say you you want to move those data into aws then we have a no code solution available which is amazon app flow okay it's a no code solution so that means you have to just configure your connection string provided that your SAS application have a connectivity with uh, with this particular service what it will do it will read the data and can move the data to s3 or redshift okay of course there can be other data destination as well but uh, today I'm going to only talk about F3 and Redshift. Okay, so App Flow is also there, which is uh, which can read data from SAS application. There are hundred plus connectors available currently in App Flow, and it is growing every year. Okay, and uh, so uh, if let's say you have data in SAP HANA, so imagine App Flow has SAP HANA connector, which can read O data and can move to your data platform. Now this is very important third party data sources. Now let's assume uh, let's take an example of a retail store. So let's say that you uh, on a Sunday in a Sunday suddenly you see that the footfall is very low in a mall. Generally what we have seen that on weekends or in weekends footfall tends to get higher. Why? Because people have holiday and they want to visit uh, or they want to go for shopping or go to movie with their family. But suddenly we realize that certain Sunday or certain uh, Saturday or certain holiday, we don't have that much of footfall even. In fact, it has actually decreased. Why? And if you want to analyze this kind of data and you want to understand the pattern, you might need a third party data, uh, data to analyze this thing. It may be possible that that day it was raining heavily. Okay, and so that's why people did not came out to visit mall. So how you will get the, those third, third party data? So we have a service called data exchange. Now this data exchange is, a, is kind of a marketplace where you can buy data or even if let's say you have data, you want to publish your data and you want to sell it, you can use this particular service. Okay, so let's say for example, you want to buy some kind of weather data. Okay, and then you can use this service. This service, you can direct, directly push it to uh, to Redshift or a data lake even there are some API by which you can consume this data. So this data exchange is integrated with our uh, data warehouse and data platform. So you can use this thing. Now last or the leaf for this uh, uh, injection layer is the streaming data. So let's think about a click stream data or an IoT data how you are going to ingest it in your data platform. So we have different services catering to different requirements for uh, streaming data sources. So we have our own IoT platform which is IoT Core. So if let's say you have IoT data, you can use IoT Core. 
we have kind of if data so if let's say you have video streams or you have uh, textual uh, data streaming uh, just assume like uh, kind of if uh, not kind of if like click stream data then you can use our kind of if services and if let's say and of course dmf as, as we discussed in in previous slides as well that uh, of course real time uh, in JFN or real time migration of your relational data or database data, you can use the DMF. Of course, DMF also supports, uh, you know, some non relational database like MongoDB as well. Then we have MSK Connect. So, MSK Connect is nothing, just manage Kafka. Okay. So, manage Kafka server is there by which, you know, if let's say you have some application which is pushing or publishing data into Kafka, then you can use also this particular service MSK. Okay. Now, with this particular uh, services, you can ingest data to Redshift or S3. Of course, open search service is there which if, uh, uh, if let's say you want to create some kind of search engine or some kind of, you know, log aggregation, then of course, this particular service can be used. Even this day, this is also used as a vector DB. But yeah. Uh, so, you can use this particular, these particular services for ingesting data to S3 or Redshift. So, when I say S3, as I said, it is more about a data lake. Now, so now the first layer is done, we'll move to the data storage. So, as I said, uh, the data storage can be your database. Let's say, for example, you have a data in uh, MySQL residing on premise and you want to move it to AWS cloud, of course, you can use DMF service or you can use Glue, both way you can move the data, okay. But today, as, we, as I said, like, you know, we are going to discuss more about a data platform from analytics perspective, okay. So, we will talk about uh, the data lake or the data warehouse, okay. So, if let's say uh, we are talking about this data storage layer, the first thing will be a data lake. So, uh, in my previous uh, diagram, I've, I have actually shown you like, you know, first it shall be there, there will be a landing zone, then you will be processing the data and then there will be a curated zone. Now, that curated zone can either be a data lake or can either be a data warehouse or it can be a combination of both. These day we call it a lake house architecture, some data in data warehouse and some data in a data lake, okay. So, your storage layer can be a data lake or can be a Redshift if you are building a data platform. Now, we'll discuss a bit about this Redshift stuff, okay, which is our uh, managed offering for a data warehouse. So, Redshift is essentially a columnar database, okay. So, all those relational database what you have heard till now, like MySQL, Postgres, SQL Server, Oracle, they are actually transactional database, okay. They are row-based database. Now, this Redshift is a column-based database, okay. It's actually used for analytical purpose. So, row-based database, just to, uh, to highlight something like, you know, for everyone is that a row based database is designed for a transactional system where you know data records are changing quite frequently then a row based database generally work better but if let's say you want to have an analytical system okay so that means you are analyzing historical data and the data going to change bit lesser you know like the frequency of changing will be bit lesser so that's why we have seen like you know people wants to move data in a batch okay then these columnar database or a big data or you know a data lake comes into the picture so redshift is actually storing the data in a columnar format now what kind of features with this uh, redshift have because it's it is actually storing data in columnar uh, format so that means the aggregation qu uh, this uh, analytical query will run faster in Redshift. Now, there are few features which I want to highlight uh, for Redshift. First is this which is a spectrum. You, you can see here a spectrum. Okay. So, just a uh, few minutes ago, I talked about a lake house architecture. So, that means, let's say you have some data which is stored in a data lake and you have some data which is stored in a data warehouse. Okay. If you want to execute a query which can get some data from Redshift and which can get some data from your data like how you can do it. So, ultimately what will happen that your analytics app or your BI app will execute query on Redshift. Inside Redshift, there will be you know some configuration for external table you have to do. What it will do like you know it will get data from Redshift table and then it will create a spectrum query which will execute on your data lake 
uh, and it can give you a combined result. So, what I mean to say here is that if you're even if let's say your data is verifying in S3 and Redshift combined, you can have a single query by which you can read both the data. Okay. Now, which data you will move to Redshift, which data you will move to a data lake. Okay. So one there can be different design patterns for this. So generally, for example, we can say like if let's say you have if let's say you have a uh, 10 years of data and 2 years of data you are frequently using. Okay, So, those frequent data you can move it to the Redshift and some non-frequent data you can move it to S3 because generally storing cost of S3 is you know bit lesser and of course you can have different tiers of S3 by which you can again save the cost. Okay, So, this way you can decide like you know which data you want to move to a data lake or which data you want to move a data warehouse. Both way it will be fine. Okay, So, we will discuss something about federated query now. So, let us say you do not want to move your data, your data is still residing in your uh, uh, traditional database which can be a SQL, which can be a Postgres or anywhere, Okay, you do not want to move the data or if let us say because the data warehouse system are generally meant for you know historical analytics, it can be like you want some report for like let us say 30 minutes or 40 minutes you know uh, data which is like committed in the system 30 or 40 minutes before then that trip will give you better result. But if let us say you want to do some kind of real time uh, analytics okay, or you if you cannot move the data okay, then you can run those federated query using that trip. So, that means the query will be fired in that trip, but ultimately inside that trip this red trip will query your operational database. Then, uh, of course, there is another feature which is uh, which I want to highlight is ML and analytics. So, there is a feature as a Redshift ML available in Redshift. So, you can create those ML model writing those you know SQL statements. So, you do not you might not need to have those you know Python skills to create those models. Okay, what you can do like you know you can just write like create model this kind of a statement and then it will create a model for you uh, analytics model for you. And then uh, of course, there are certain set of algorithm which is available in Redshift. Based on that, you can create those model and because your data is already residing in Redshift or in data lake, it can train that uh, that data based on uh, uh, Redshift data or your data lake data. And then of course, after that, you know, once the data model is trained, that inference part means your once the prediction part will be there, it can be deployed on your Redshift cluster itself, saving your cost. Okay, you do not need a separate cluster for that. Of course, that decision you have to take, but this is also possible with Redshift. And there are other features which are uh, coming in Redshift. Uh, one is like uh, uh, the zero ETL features. For example, if let us say your data is already in, in Aurora DB, Aurora is our D database for Postgres and, and uh, MySQL, which is a cluster. Okay. And if you want to move it to the Redshift, you might not need any ET, uh, any separate ETL service like Glue or DMS for that. Going forward, you can directly move it to the Redshift. So we are generally going towards that zero ETL kind of feature right now. So currently, this uh, uh, Postgres, uh, sorry, Aurora Postgres and Aurora MySQL uh, uh, zero ETL feature is available. Okay, I need to check. Like uh, I, I believe that this is not available in India yet, but it will be sooner or later. It will be available in India as well. Now, so data storage layer if done, what about data cataloging? So, the third part is data cataloging. So, data cataloging is nothing, how to make sense of the data. For example, our mind is trained to see the data in a relational format. We do not know how generally, generally I mean most of the people do not know how uh, internally Oracle or let us say Postgres or let us say SQL for they are storing the data. But how generally we visualize like you know we generally query it in a SQL statement and then what happens that uh, we see the data in a tabular format. Okay, Behind the scene whether it, they are storing it in a file format, whether they are storing it in a certain different format, uh, most of the people do not know it. Okay, So generally when we say cataloging, so means like how to visualizing it in a certain format, be it a relational format. Generally, our mind is trained like that. Okay, So, for uh, for Redshift, generally you create the table structure first and then of course you are inserting the data for those that those table or those schema you can consider it as a data catalog. But what about data lake? So, you have data in S3, but how to make, uh, how to use those data. Okay, So, you need to have a relational structure on top of that, how you will, uh, you are going to create that. So, for, uh, remember I told you that I am going to use this glue word again and again. So, here again, this data catalog we build 
on top of glue. So, glue is not, not just about the ETL, it also have a feature for data catalog. By default, this data catalog will be built on Hive, okay. When we say Hive, so generally Hive data are immutable, so you cannot change it. But Glue data catalog also supports Hudi, Iceberg, you know, those, uh, those uh, uh, data catalog which can be, you know, which can have those effect transaction as well, okay. So, Glue, by using Glue, you can build a data catalog on top of that. And generally, you know, like you are, if you are building a data lake, you are storing data in F3, so that means your cost of storing will be very less. Then, if you are building this data catalog using Glue, Okay, so generally it cost you uh, less than you know two three dollar for uh, for one million object uh, uh, for a month. Okay, so you we we can definitely check the price, but of course uh, it's quite less. Okay, so cataloging your data don't take too much of uh, you know uh, too much of cost on AWS, and uh, you can choose your format whether you want a high format whether you want. Uh, uh, whether you want uh, what you can say uh, iceberg or whether you want a hoodie format you can use this data catalog uh, glue data catalog feature so of course one side uh, of the spectrum one side of the uh, uh, spectrum edge actually redshift which is our data warehouse the same thing you can build a data lake also uh, again the data will be stored the data you can store it in a columnar format columnar format is also possible in a uh, in a in a data lake which can be a parquet or can be an ORV. And then on top of that, you can build a asset data lake, which can be a iceberg data lake or which can be a hoodie data lake using glue. Now, so data processing layer. So of course, you have ingested the data and now you want to do some kind of cleaning. How you can do that cleaning, okay? So we have services called EMR and glue. I have already discussed a lot about glue right now that it can be used as an ETL service, it can be used as a catalog. Apart from that, it has own uh, visualization tool as well by which you know if you don't want to write code, you can do those uh, drag and drop things and you can create those ETL pipeline. But if let's say you are a geek and you want to write some code, PySpark code, then you can also use EMR services. Okay, so EMR is nothing just a managed Hadoop. Okay, and of course in Manage Hadoop you can install Spark and then you can run your Spark code on top of that and then of course you can process your data and the destination can be anything. It can be your F3, it can be your uh, data warehouse, even it can be your, you know, uh, normal database as well. Even if you can send the data to, uh, to uh, open search as well. Moving ahead, so with AMR, so now uh, you already have an ETL tool, you already know how to ingest the data, you know how to catalog the data, you know how to process the data. But while processing, there can be a business problem as well, like let's say you have 20 table or 30 table, okay? And you want to move the data in a certain sequence or let's say you have a problem that you are ingesting a data into a table and then you want to do some kind of work and then after that only, that but an another job you want to run, okay? How you are going to orchestrate this thing? So there are a couple of services which is provided by AWS. First one is uh, Amazon Managed Workflow for Apache Airflow. It's just a managed cluster for Apache Airflow. If you want to go for an open source thing, then you can go with this thing. Of course, there will be a cost associated with this. Another one is a step function. So if let's say you have you are using uh, AWS native services and you want to create some kind of workflow you can create using AWS step function. We will discuss about uh, data consumption now. So data consumption, when we talk about data consumption, of course, you can consume it via uh, AIML models, you can consume it via uh, API, and you can consume it via your BI tool. I will discuss a bit about our BI tool, which is quick site actually. So let's say you have a business problem by which you want to embed the uh, embed your report in your application. And if let's say you have a multi-tenant solution and you want to expose the data set and you want your tenant to create the report uh, yourself, uh, themselves, okay? And, it, uh, and let's say, you know, you want to run some kind of NLQ query, okay? In just like English statement, then how you can do it? So our quick site, solution provides all these things in a one service okay and it is price based on user so there 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 is a price for 
author who is creating the report there is a prize for a reader who is reading the report and the good thing is like reader prize is fifth and best so let's say nlq feature is not enabled and you have a reader so it will be price like 30 cent per uh, session so when we say uh, 30 cent per session and it is capped at 5 dollar uh it i'm talking about you know something which is uh, uh, when nlq is not enabled and it is capped at 5 uh, 5 dollars so that means let's say if a user is reading the report three time or four times okay so it he will be charged like let's say three time he is reading the report so that means only 90 cent will be applied uh, cost will come but if let's say uh, uh if a frequent user is coming and he is every day he is opening report 10 times okay 300 times or 400 times or even 1000 times he is opening the report in a month then the maximum it will charge you 5 dollar per month okay so that is for you know named user of course the user who is uh, you know registered with uh, with quick fat but there is a possibility that you want to build a public dashboard okay where you don't know who the user will be there so a capacity pricing is also available with quick fat with quick fat you can do 100% white labeling so it's just like drag and drop thing it has in memory computation available as well up to 1 terabyte you can uh, pull the data into quick fat memory and it can do like you know in memory calculation and which will be very fast it is uh, possible with quick fat so now the data consumption layer is completed so i am not going to talk bit about uh, aml of course we have different service for aml as well i am not going to talk about api of course you can uh, create some kind of micro service or you can create your graphql api on top of you know uh, on top of your uh, data layer but yes uh, there can be different mean by which you can consume your data lastly it's security and governance so i told you like uh, i i am going to come back to this lake formation service so lake formation is a very important service for us okay by which you can create a data mesh architecture so that means you have different uh, different department and each department want to share the data with uh, with the data platform they want to put some kind of restriction what data they want to share you know and there will be a consumer who will be consuming that data certain consumer they you don't want to you know uh, access certain data so that kind of you know uh, that kind of restriction you can put using lake formation of course lake formation has a feature called blueprint by which you can ingest the data lake formation uh, you know you, uh, can provide some kind of restrict can put some kind of you know restriction on the data like which data will be accessible to whom you can share your data to different account as well using uh, lake formation you can put your security rules so there are other services as well by which you can go on the data for example backup if there if you want to do some kind of business continuity then backup is there if you want to do the auditing cloud trail is there you want to see error log cloud watch is there and if you want to secure your sensitive data then my fee is there okay so as i said there are different services which can help you in doing those uh, in doing those you know security and governance compliance for uh, for on your data lake formation as i said uh, you can do multiple thing with lake formation you can create a data mesh architecture with lake formation you can uh, put some kind of restriction on data like you know which data will be seen by uh, uh, which one you know some department if you want to put restriction you can do that thing with lake formation and of course there are different services like aws backup is there if let's say you want to do backup data at certain interval you can use aws backup if you want to audit your data of course you can use cloud trail uh, you want to see the error logs you can use cloud watch if you want to secure your sensitive data or if you want to hide those data you can use mesh so there are different services available in in aws by which you can govern your data so we'll skip this slide uh, now last is the reference architecture so so if you see this architecture okay so you can have multiple data sources you can use dmf data sync can if services or kafka or iot core or app flow you can ingest the data in s3 of course you can use lake formation to govern the data and then once the data will be here then you can process the data using glue or data brew you can also put an emr here and then once the data is processed either the destination can be your uh, redshift it can be even a s3 data lake you can consume it via quick fight you can move it to the open search service okay if you want to create some kind of search engine you can do that and of course you can consume it via ml models as well so you can do all these things using 
uh, uh, AWF data for so this is a just a reference architecture of course you can uh, have a different architecture uh, you know de depends upon your business case or depend upon your business case complexity the architecture can be different but in a nutshell this is kind of a overall architecture for uh, building a data architecture on AWS with this I'd like to finish uh, this presentation thank you very much